Hi guys, this is a video on the very beginnings of the periodic table and so really it's just kind of an elaboration of the true basics. Before we get into the quantum mechanical model I want to make sure that you know where the different types of elements are, how to read the periodic table and so on. And so here we're going to briefly identify metals, nonmetals, and metalloids on the periodic table. And then we're going to come back later and really get more detailed about the different uh, groups there. There we go. So this is where we are right now. Now remember guys, there are three types of elements. There's metals versus nonmetals. Now you can kind of see this periodic table is the one I chose because it is um, the, well it's color coded, I mean, yay. You can kind of see that blue means metals and what's really kind of nice is as we look at the periodic table you can kind of determine almost everything is a metal by a lot. We do have some nonmetals, they're over here on the right, except for hydrogen. But it's kind of interesting because depending on the periodic table we use, usually it's like this, but occasionally they'll actually write helium in like this instead. Or over here they'll put hydrogen. And that's because hydrogen has properties that are both consistent with the alkali metals and group 7 over here. Helium has properties both of the noble gases here and group 2 there. And so it really just kind of depends. So we're going to use this basic model, but just kind of keep that in mind as we go into the quantum mechanical model um, that you may want to write on your periodic table quite a bit. Now, a couple of things. Groups are columns. Now everything in a column is going to have very similar properties, okay? Technically, like over here, this is the noble gas column. It has a, a tendency to not react. They are relatively stable, relatively happy as they are. And so with that in mind, they usually don't do much. Now periods, on the other hand, just like over a period of time, or a period uh, in history, what can happen is across a row, or which is a period, you can have uh, traits or characteristics change. And that is important as we go into the, the, the next section, I'm sorry words are eluding me this morning. So here we've got metals versus nonmetals. We just talked about that, groups and families. Now what's great is this periodic table is color coded even more intricately and you can kind of see that the orange right here are the alkali metals. Alkali metals are pretty reactive honestly. They react with water and the only thing that changes within this family is how quickly do they react with water, okay? So like sodium, I think I mentioned, I think I might have, sodium is highly reactive. I used to purchase it when I had a hood in my classroom and what's great is sodium, it's the same as any other metal. It's just, you know, kind of shiny, kind of malleable. It is easy to work with, but it is highly reactive. Uh, when I was in high school, my teacher was much braver than me. She used huge pieces. Science companies have gotten much smarter. They only give tiny bits anymore. You can't purchase large ones. And so um, what you would do is inside a hood, it has to be in a hood because you don't want to, you know, get hurt. You have a beaker with water. Now, alkali metals are usually stored under mineral oil, so they're in this, you know, well, you can't really see that jar, can you? Uh, they're stored under oil so that they don't react with the water. 
in the air. And so what you do is you take some tongs from lab and you pick one piece out, you throw it at the beaker of water carefully, uh, throw this, the hood down and pretty much run to the back of the classroom. Now what happens is as soon as the oil comes off of that metal, it will start reacting instantly with water. There's usually flames, there are sparks, and even with the tiny, tiny chunks that they sell, I've managed to catch a hood. Uh, I've managed to have a small fire in a hood before. Usually the, the flames and stuff are so uh, violent. If you have like a paper towel or something nearby, it can spark, which is why you're supposed to do it in a hood. Alkaline earth metals are this paler orange right here. They are also reactive, but a little less so. Um, they will uh, react, but typically you have to use more like, um, oops, like an, an acidic solution to get it to happen. Um, it takes a little bit longer for them to actually react with water itself, um, but it can happen. Now they're also called alkaline earth metals um, because they're found in the earth. Calcium is a primary form of, you know, it's in limestone. Limestone is primarily made of calcium. Um, you, magnesium is part of a lot of metals and so on. Now the other thing I want to say is the alkali or alkaline earth metals and alkali metals. These are um, so elements that when they do react with water make a basic solution. And if you kind of think back to, I don't know, one of the X-Men, um, they talked about the fact that alkali actually means base. And so when we say alkali metals or alkaline earth metals, it means that they will form a basic solution with water. Now, then this yellow section right here is called the transition metals. They have transitional properties. They are used for a ton of things, honestly. Uh, copper, we use in pennies. It's got a nice orange color. Zinc, on the other hand, is very silverish in color and uh, is pretty reactive. Now, in fact, um, well, let's go ahead and talk about it. I think I could talk about it later too, but this is fun stuff. Zinc, because it is able to react, it's willing to oxidize pretty quickly. It is used in as a sacrificial metal in a lot of areas. And so kind of thinking about, well, this is in, we're close to Norfolk, right? So if you have a boat in water, generally the hull can rust. And so what they started doing is taking this huge piece of sacrificial zinc and they attach it to the bottom. And what happens is when you're in water, uh, when you're in the ocean, when you're in wherever, the zinc will corrode much faster than the iron or the steel that makes up the hull. And so by spending a little bit of money on this sacrificial metal, you have essentially saved yourself from having to rehaul your boat. Now they also use it in things like pipes because of the same thing. You have a pipe, you don't want to have your whole house um, get a small hole, you know, because pinholes and pipes are annoying. They cause flooding and um, honestly it costs over 10 grand, usually more like 20 to 30 grand to repipe a home, okay? So again, by galvanizing your pipes with a little bit of zinc, it ends up saving you money in the long run, okay? Things like iron. Iron is super strong. It is used a lot in uh, structural components. It's uh, one of the main elements used to make steel, which is for bridges and other stuff. Titanium is a light 
silverish color. It almost looks like tin in appearance. It's very lightweight. It's deceptively light. It almost makes you think that it is uh, not expensive, but it is. The interesting thing about titanium is it is super duper strong. And so even though it's lightweight, you can't always uh, cut through it the way you can cut through other metals. They used to use titanium uh, as a lot of decorative jewelry, especially like male wedding rings. If you've ever seen a male wedding ring, they're huge. I mean, it's like a huge chunk of metal. It kind of almost like Lord of the Rings type. It's a huge, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. And so you don't want to have a really heavy ring, you know, weighing down their arm. And so they would use titanium. The problem with using titanium is, um, no offense guys, but guys tend to be kind of rough and tumble. And if they were in an accident, you know, car accident, at work, something, and that ring got smushed. Oops, no, go away. No, go away. There we go. You know, you've got your hand, and this ring is kind of smushed. It, you can't get it off. It feels bad. It's cutting off circulation. You, there's been more than a one account of men going to the emergency room with that situation. The hospital did not have equipment that was strong enough to cut the ring off so they ended up cutting the finger and you cut the finger off you remove the ring and then you reattach the finger it ended up being easier than trying to find somewhere in the tri-state area that had something strong enough to cut off titanium so now occasionally they'll put titanium like decorations on a wedding ring uh, but they typically stay away from it in favor of things like chromium or tungsten Chromium and tungsten, uh, very similar. Chromium has kind of a bluish tint. Tungsten has kind of a gunmetal gray color. They're really beautiful, uh, just total gorgeous metals. Um, they really work for a lot of different things. So anyway, the idea is as we look at transition metals in a little while, just keep in mind that these transitional metals have transitional properties and they're used pretty much everywhere. I'm sure you experience it all the time. So from batteries to who knows what else. Now the metalloids are right here. And if you go back to the last slide, they're orange here. There's only a few, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium. We don't really use tellurium in uh, the other very often, but you know. Now, same thing here. We kind of group these nonmetals together because there's more than one type of element. This is not going to be a group that we spend a lot of time on. But we do really focus on the halogens. Now, the halogens have their nonmetals. They tend to be present in nature as gases, mostly bromine isn't, but you know. Um, they are also highly reactive. They typically want to be bonded to somebody, okay? And then you have the noble gases right here who are non-reactive, just like the nobility in, you know, a few centuries ago. They didn't really interact with much of other parts of society. Noble gases don't either. They typically just stick to themselves. They're happy the way they are. They've got everything they need. Now, as we go into looking at these, we're going to get into some details about what the electrons are, but these are the families I need you to know about. Now, I do have this trend. I want to kind of go back for a minute. It's probably easier if I show you on this one. We typically call this group one, group two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We skip over this when we're talking about groups usually. Now the charge is going to be, if these guys form ions, remember we talked about ions with atomic structure, the charge typically for alkali metals is plus one, alkaline earth metals is plus two, for this group it's three plus, which really we only deal with aluminum mostly. Skip group four, then it's three minus, two minus, and one minus. Halogens have to gain one electron to look like 
the noble gases gaining a negative means you have a negative one charge. Group six, oxygen, sulfur, they have to gain one, two electrons to look like the noble gases. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, they have to gain three. You gain three negatives, uh, negatively charged electrons, you have a three minus charge. This alkali metals, they have to lose one to go back and look like a noble gas. Alkaline earth metals, they lose one and then two, and so on, okay? Now that's gonna make more sense after we discuss the electron configuration, but for the moment, just kinda of keep in mind, guys, that this is leading into that. And I just, I feel like it's gonna be easier if you see this and then we go into electron configuration, okay? So here's what a question could look like. Name a halogen in the fifth period. Well, halogen means this is group seven. Period means we're gonna count down five rows. There you go. One, two, three, four, five. Oops, actually you can't see this, can you? Let's go back to the other one. I kind of like this. It looks much more like the uh, the one you guys get on the exam. So I'm going to count down one, two, three, four, five periods. And I'm going to go over to group seven. And I see iodine. It's totally not what I th thought, but OK. Now, alkaline earth metal in the third period. This is group two. third period, one, two, three, alkaline earth metal should be here. Now on the exam, you're going to get a multiple choice question, but just remember guys, um, just because it's multiple choice doesn't mean it's easy. In fact, I totally think that if you write a multiple choice question correctly, it's harder than free response because it's all or nothing, okay? So please make sure you truly understand groups versus period and what those groups that we need to know are, okay?